I don't know which what the number is. I think it's the fifth in the series of globalization talks. Uh, well, today it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Anna Davich from uh, Glasgow University for delivering her uh, talk here uh, about the uh, multi basically based upon multiculturalism and European intervention in Kosovo and its. Uh, foreseen and unforeseen, I guess, consequences. Let me introduce Anna to you, properly, formally, that is. Anna received her BA from Novi Zad University in former Yugoslavia, and then moved on to receiving her MA degree from the prestigious Institute of Social Studies in The Hague in Politics of Development. Then she moved on to complete her PhD in sociology from the University of California at San Diego. So as you see, she has a very cosmopolitan educational background. The bulk of Anna's research uh, is, of course, in the sociology and politics of ethnic divisions, nationality, citizenship, gender, social movements, uh, and Western interventions, as the title of her talk suggests, Western interventions in the nationalist violence and civil society building. Recently, a new era, area of rather Anna's research uh, is the interaction between recent migrations and deportations of ex-Yugoslav migrants and uh, in the, from the European Union and the emerging citizenship regimes. She can explain this better than I do. I think she has the ex-Yugoslavian Romans in mind, the Roman population. The Ro Deportation, re-entry, deportation, re-entry, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, Anna's, as I said, most recent affiliation is with the University of Glasgow. Previous appointments, however, include a postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University, an assistant professorship at Bill Kent University, where I met her, uh, an associate professorship in Aarhus, University in Denmark, where I had the pleasure of being as well, you didn't know, and the University of Bonn. She published in various journals, some of which are National Identities, Journal of Ethnic Studies, Ethno Ethnopolitics, International Journal of Politics, Culture and Society, and Anthropology of East European Review. And she has also edited a volume called or titled Nationalism, Multiculturalism and Democracy with the University of Bonn European Integration Series. She has also received uh, research, teaching and study awards from many institutions including Fulbright Commission, the US Social Science Research Council which is again a very hard place to obtain a scholarship Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and the German DAAD Fellowship Program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Anna, the floor is yours. I'll, I'll go in down. I'll go down and sit there. If you don't want me here, do you? Uh, as you wish. All right. I'll go and sit there. Thank you very much.
because I'm already kind of um, hovering <laughs> above everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, everyone can see me? Yeah? All right. So without further ado, I just am going to move on. And let me just give you a little bit of a background to the stories that I'm going to present you uh, today. I first went to Kosovo in 2003. Um, this is not something that one should uh, boast about, but if you were coming uh, from places in former Yugoslavia and you were not originally from Kosovo, this was not a popular destination for anyone. So I personally never knew a single person who ever went to Kosovo when I was growing up. Um, so this is just to tell you that this is kind of a, this is probably nothing particularly strange about it. You know, people in many countries uh, usually go to places which are considered to be attractive, you know, sea coasts and uh, ski resorts. Um, when I was growing up, you know, places where there were rock music uh, festivals or theater festivals, film festivals, things that you are in when you're growing up. Well, you know, Kosovo and some other places. In fact, I personally never had been south of Belgrade until I was uh, in Serbia. But I had been to Bosnia, I had been to Macedonia, to Croatia and Slovenia. But, you know, there was this particular geographical area of southeast which was not on the map of attractive spots in the country. So this is just to tell you that this is the year 2003 and for the first time in my life I'm actually traveling south in um, the country that had in the meantime uh, disappeared. So this is now the state of Serbia, this is now the state of Kosovo, so that was my first time and I could go there um, as a researcher piggybacking the consultancy uh, mission of the Danish uh, Ministry of Development and so I was part of the expert group of a consultancy firm that was supposed to evaluate the effects of humanitarian aid that the Danish government had provided. So this was part of what is called the exit strategy um, situation, so when uh, donors are withdrawing money from the region, then they're supposed to hire someone to write an evaluation to see how well they had done. Um, so it involves, on my part as a sociologist, I was supposed to create um, a team of local sociologists and their students who would actually be going around the beneficiaries of Western assistance, primarily Danish, but I asked for permission to actually include other um, aid uh, beneficiaries, other countries and other multilateral organized donors um, beneficiaries. So what I did is I created a group of people that consisted of the two halves who actually could not directly communicate with each other, meaning there was a sociology group in Pristina and a sociology group in North Mitrovica. So this is the um, just to let you know, this is the area that has parallel authorities that are funded by the Serbian government. You know, the city of Mitrovica in Kosovo is divided in two parts. South of Mitrovica is administered by the Central Pristina Authority and the northern part is still uh, a contested area. So this was an inc incredibly interesting time for me and of course time of also experiencing um, a responsibility and shame you know, that you had not even experienced the slightest interest in those parts of your former country and so many things um, and horrible things had happened in the meantime that I now went more uh, there as a sociologist and an observer. So it was a strong impetus for me to actually try to engage further with the region and so my continuous involvement uh, in Kosovo then went on um, after receiving a grant from a Dutch foundation uh, to teach summer schools in Pristina and in North Mitrovica. And this is sort of an engagement that continues. So I'm sorry if this was too long, but I'm sure that this is this kind of meta-academic impetus for all of us is something important. So I just wanted to share this with you briefly. All right. So um, this is what I'm just kind of putting on the table as the main problems of uh, conflict resolution, peace building exports, and this is something which, uh, of course, we can discuss as a general issue. So what we see in uh, 
discussions about the goals of peace uh, building interventions, it seems that the qualities, the characteristics of democracy are er everywhere the same. So democracy is considered to be a package that you can actually export in whichever region and then subsequently it could take off. So in other words, it includes an imagination of a space that is something like a blank slate. What is also interesting, uh, especially in the period after the end of the Cold War, is that civil society assumes in these um, export packages a particularly important place. We can, you know, this is another issue for an interesting discussion, you know, how theories of civil society actually had uh, developed and what kind of interesting emphasis we, what kind of the dyna a dynamics of interesting changing emphasis when one discusses civil society's place in politics one sees, not just in the last 20 years, but in the last 50 years after the end of the, after the beginning of the Cold War actually. So civil society here is assumed to actually be uh, able to take a leading role in rebuilding ties, in uh, building democracy, and civil society is endowed with such power in this imagination of uh, peace building uh, exports that one can even uh, see the state as having a rather marginal role. Of course, what is unsaid here, but what is understood in many concrete situations, uh, uh, violence that precedes this peace building effort um, actually uh, creates a state that is no longer viable. Uh, in many cases it is considered by foreign donors as a bad state, as a rogue state, as a state that needs co to be completely uh, redone. So civil society has this enormous task on its shoulders to actually uh, on the one hand be a um, serious weight countering what the state had done previously, and also uh, uh, act as a very strong uh, lobbying uh, umbrella vis-a-vis -vis the state that is being under construction. Uh, what is important uh, further here for these um, export packages of peace is that in the areas where we're speaking about quote-unquote ethnic conflict, there we find um, exports of very homogenized notions of majorities versus minorities. So in the project uh, universe that you read about um, projects that contribute to developing peace and democracy in post-violence regions characterized with quote-unquote ethnic conflict, we find particular concepts of the majority and minorities that are, as I would argue, uh, these are homogenized and rather static uh, concepts that are problematic from both theoretical and practical implementation point of view. So um, here, finally, we come to the question about what kind of citizenship one expects in these regions where uh, peace depends very much on foreign intervention. What kind of citizens one can find there? And I suggest that we discover there and analyze tensions that exist, and they're of course not, these are not tensions that were, uh, that came about for the first time in these regions where Western intervention is taking place. These tensions are inherent and, you know, historically present uh, in the West as well. Tensions uh, within citizenship as rights on the one hand, as identity, and as a particular uh, status and of course uh, privileges that go with it. Now uh, the research that I have done and here I'm sort of moving on a little bit to more concrete uh, stuff and this is uh, what I'm going to say now is based on my research and interviews over several years with uh, many NGOs not only in Kosovo but um, I have done much more extensive uh, teaching work in Bosnia and Herzegovina and more NGO and activist work uh, because I was also personally 
and in my own in, and biographically much more connected to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this is kind of the, the universe of NGOs that I have um, worked with. So on the one hand, these are the NGOs and what they themselves perceive as their, as their primary task, as their possibilities. And then there is also what is called the uh, the donors and large intermediary NGOs who are actually uh, giving money to these NGOs and what it is that they imagine that, lo that local NGOs should be doing and what it is that they can achieve. So from the point of view of what uh, donors and large foreign intermediary NGOs are um, imagining about these NGOs is that they are absolutely paramount and necessary for the future civil society to be built. Again, as I mentioned in this very general introduction, they are supposed to be pacifying the state, if the state is supposed to be dangerous and um, having kind of a very negative um, recent history. Uh, and they're also supposed to be, in a way, unburdening it, which is another very problematic aspects here, that many functions that the state was supposed to be carrying in the past, and of course when we speak about the socialist region, you know, we're having in mind particular uh, role of the state as uh, protector uh, as, and as donor of a uh, plethora of social services, so they're supposed to be unburdening the state as well, pacifying, um, countering, and unburdening. So, um, at the same time, NGOs are supposed, those who are involved, those which are involved in, uh, directly in peace building efforts, in alleviating the consequences of the negative uh, experiences of inter-ethnic violence, uh, they are supposed to be the offspring of an international effort. In a way, they are the direct consequence of the foreign effort to build a completely new peaceful society. So they're emissaries of this foreign mission. Which, of course, then leads us to a question, is it possible and is there an evidence of the fact, of the supposed fact, that perhaps in the past that local civil society did have some of its own uh, capacities or its own mechanisms or its own activities that perhaps were working towards building a non-nationalist or multi-ethnic society. So by assuming that there are these NGOs who are direct offsprings of Western intervention, there is an idea that there was no prior uh, civil society that could have been involved in such activities or having such imagination of peace. And of course what is the consequence of this role is that there is certain conception of what civil society is, what goals it should have, uh, there is a certain definition of multiculturalism inscribed in the civil society uh, activities, so and there is particularly what many people in the, on the ground call project uh, lingo. There is a particular language, <clears throat> there is a contents uh, of certain projects uh, that uh, these donors constantly operate within. <clears throat> Excuse me. The consequence of this situation, and this is what you hear from many people on the ground who are long-time NGO workers, is that they do not experience their situation as civil society actors as being equal in negotiating uh, the goals and activities with those people who actually um, appear as funding givers. And Sarah White, who is an anthropologist of development, has a categorization of the relationships that um, civil society actors local civil society actors can have with the international actors who give them funding and who provide them with the script of what it is that they should do on the ground. 
So in this categorization of the relationships that exist between domestic and foreign actors, it seems that at best local civil society actors here are in an instrumental relationship, which means that in terms of the official tasks and priorities and goals, they have almost no say. But in terms of how they do things on the ground, that very often depends on how skillful they are. So you find many situations where people had learned after many years to actually abide by the official language of multiculturalism and peace, um, definitions of inter-ethnic relations, definitions of projects that one can do to demonstrate that inter-ethnic relations had been um, improved. But at the same time, they are skillful. So in fact, on the ground, they can do a little bit of their own improvised work and in a way find some kind of a, a peace in terms of their conscience and in terms of what they provide for the population on the ground. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now, when you speak with, uh, with people who are involved for many years with the NGO work that deals with inter-ethnic relations and rebuilding uh, multi-ethnic society, then actually it seems that there are several types of fears that local NGOs experience. The situation is such that the rebuilding of inter-ethnic relations comes after a period of uh, horrible violence. And in the case of Kosovo, this new state has been built as a consequence of a victorious violent struggle. This is the situation, how it is widely perceived. So, if you are an NGO worker in this situation, then from the point of view of um, someone working in the field, you actually need to be very careful in terms of how it is that you're going to define this recent past of violence. How are you going to actually uh, talk to people coming from different ethnic backgrounds where it's not the ethnicity that is it important, but it is the recent situation in which these people found themselves during the war and violence. So how are you going to address the need for inter-ethnic coexistence and cohabitation without talking about recent violence and these different perceptions about to what extent violence was necessary, it was not necessary. So how are you going to organize the imagination of this interesting society without challenging some hegemonic definitions that exist about the necessity for violence, the necessity of a state that emanated from the oppression against one ethnic group. And of course, this is not a question that pertains to Kosovo only. This is why I'm trying to, to put it in, in more general terms. So if there is a perception that there was a, an oppressive state, that there was a long time oppression coming from the Serbian state. So how are you going now to actually talk about the new forms of peace and inter-ethnic relations uh, without being political? That is a big problem uh, because when uh, donors talk about civil society, uh, and when people on the ground talk about civil society, it is supposed to be an alternative to politics. So there is a um, rather, rather strange situation for these people on the ground. So as a consequence, uh, many of the NGO workers do not want to appear in the eyes of the local population as being too nice to uh, those people who are nowadays redefined as ethnic minorities, especially when you have the situation when the previous state has disintegrated. So the whole map of who is majority, who is, a, who is a minority, now is redefined by this new map. Uh, as an NGO worker, you ha are having actually very difficult times uh, not to appear too lenient to uh, those people that in the eyes of many people are identified with an ethnic, or with an oppressor ethnic group. 
Another <coughs> problem for civil society actors is that they would not want to side with particular political parties. This is not something that they are allowed to do. Uh, in many cases, this is something what they have to do. But they are in a situation when they cannot really make this open and visible. And as I mentioned already previously, there is of course a problem. Uh, what happens if you disagree with uh, the funding agency's ideas, uh, which in many cases creates schizophrenia in the minds of those who are working on these issues because they have to pretend that they are fulfilling certain goals. In fact, they are trying to do different things on the ground. And now I'm going to talk about something completely different. And this is uh, something that I accidentally started discovering as I was working in the field, as I was going after the list of particular NGOs that were depending on funding for doing this particular task that were putting together, for example, women from different ethnic backgrounds who were spending their leisure time doing some common, in many cases, typical female activities. You know, this is one area which is considered to be very good for establishing peace and good inter-ethnic relations, sort of putting people to do uh, some uh, domestic, quote-unquote, work, uh, including handicrafts, which can be afterwards sold. So, you know, this is this whole idea of empowering women. And then if you then bring women from different ethnic backgrounds, they're going to be talking to each other, and they are going to be very, feeling very good about it. And I'm not quite sure then how it is imagined to go on, but this is kind of very typical setup for uh, rebuilding peace in violence-torn regions. So as I was going from these situations from one to another, and traveling around, I discovered something very interesting. I discovered that actually there were cases of uh, inter-ethnic, not just coexistence, but also inter-ethnic work in the areas which did not receive any foreign funding. Um, that is, of course, something that we all know. Uh, when we're talking about peace, rebuilding, uh, inter-ethnic relations, improvement. This is supposed to be happening in a world, in a universe, where somehow people are not supposed to work. No, I'm just you know, throwing this on you just to imagine that in the areas where you are supposed to rebuild inter-ethnic relations, the question, normal question would be, you know, how is this going to happen? You know, is this going to be happening during uh, someone's uh, working hours, or is it going to be happening during one's leisure hours? So what is shocking about the imagination of uh, these places where you're supposed to rebuild uh, multicultural, multi-ethnicity, nobody talks about work. These areas are supposed to be so devastated, and uh, of course now I'm trying to be a bit ironic here, uh, Yes, these places are to be so devastated that people are basically all found on blank slates, in shambles. Um, there is no imagination of the economy. Uh, so I was interested to see actually whether people are actually working. And I found out that they are working. Um, and I found several uh, remarkable examples of factories that were producing bricks, of dairy farms in these regions that perhaps don't mean much to you, like Anna Morava and Gilan in Kosovo, um, where these are private factories, private dairy farms, where um, Kosovo Albanians are working with Serbs and with local Roma population, depending on the geographical setup uh, and demographic setup of the region. Uh, some of these areas actually did not experience the most horrible instances of violence in the past, so which also means that the demographic situation had not been so radically transformed as in other regions. But what was very interesting is when you were, when I was doing interviews with the people who are owners of these factories, managers, people who are uh, working, and it was not very difficult because these are very small enterprises and there was actually no uh, even need for anyone to make these interviews very formal. People are actually very glad that someone wants to talk to someone who is simply working. 
and it was even the reaction of the people on the ground, like, you want to talk to us, but we're only working. We're not doing anything important, which was, to me, uh, quite, quite heartbreaking in, in some way. I'm sorry, I just moved to a wrong slide. No, this is not the one. All right, let me just go to the slideshow. So um, what was uh, very important for the outcome of these interviews is that uh, people on the, on the ground were quite annoyed with those definitions of inter-ethnic relations that were offered to them at, in a packaged form. They were much more interested in actually talking how they came about to maintain the same type of relations that they had prior to the war and even prior to the establishment of Milosevic's apartheid regime. That was also quite a poignant um, experience that people were very interested, those who were old enough, to recall their biographical, um, their biographies prior to 1989 and the official um, is that the, the situation where Kosovo Albanians were expelled from their jobs, from all public uh, services, etc. So, in a way, I found myself in the situation uh, coming from the outside and as an outsider expecting, like so many uh, foreign reporters, to be delivered the stories of the horrors of inter ethnic uh, tensions and uh, the impossibilities of. Uh, rebuilding uh, multiculturalism according to certain definitions. So I found myself actually listening to the people who are trying to tell me that I was wrong, uh, which I found, I think, as a very, very serious impetus to, to continue working in the field. Uh, and interestingly enough, when, uh, when you would ask people who are either owners or managers or people who are simply working in these small enterprises what it is that they consider as the greatest threat to uh, their future, they were talking about uh, the threat of becoming the European Union because they were afraid that such small economic enterprises could not continue being viable. So in a way, they were experiencing, their, their fears were primarily on this economic level, which showed uh, quite a great, quite a good awareness of what global restructuring, you know, framed by the European Union actually means in the process of the European Union enlargement in a region that is by and large agricultural. The only other thing that you have, apart from the possibilities for these uh, medium-sized farms, is um, natural resources. You know, there is a very large mining complex in Kosovo that prior to the late 80s used to employ something like 50,000 people, if not more, and which had lied in shambles for the last 20 years. Um, so the, this vignette about uh, work and about what it is that people do in their daily lives when we do not consider them as dependent on uh, Western intervention in peace building and in inter-ethnic relations. The fact that uh, we as researchers do not think about this at all, about this daily life and what it is that people do in order to survive, shows that we as analysts, but also people who provide um, aid, for um, rebuilding peace in such reasons that we show a huge neglect for the previous history of civil society and in more concrete terms the experience of work, the experience of social safety networks, the experience of the organization of life on the micro level. How many minutes do I still have? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'm just going to uh, summarize now what it is that I consider as an invitation to do future work about multiculturalism in the regions such as the one of my interest, but also perhaps we could have further discussion about those regions that um, you are working on. And so what are the challenges of what I call the hidden or unstructured multiculturalism? You know, I gave 
now one example from the area of work as the manifestation of this hidden or unstructured multiculturalism. We can, of course, also then talk about what is the difference between the officially mandated packaged uh, uh, multiculturalism and the one that I call unstructured because it is coming bottom up. So the exceptions, um, such as the one that I mentioned, they actually problematize uh, what I mentioned in the beginning, the homogenized and static and bounded conceptions of ethnicity and subsequently same forms of um, bounded multiculturalism and bounded uh, conception of ethnic reconciliation. It puts into question these uh, widely accepted concepts. I mentioned one example and that is of work, but we can think about other areas where these hidden multiculturalisms live their lives, often passing unnoticed from the point of view of researchers. And these are the areas of uh, old friendships, neighborhood uh, layouts, educational experiences, and you can think about the opportunities for education that are also coming as imports into many areas of um, where violence had taken place, where new, in particularly for students, they are particular opportunities to actually build new forms of networks, both within the same region and trans-border. Uh, this uh, also invites us to uh, pay more attention to ethnographic work and to ethnographic method, and also to engage in more cross-border uh, re cross research. It also invites us to be more attentive when we talk about ethnographies to autobiographical narratives that provide us with links to the past of the people that we're studying, in particularly in those cases where, as I mentioned in my presentation, where the past of recent uh, ethnic violence creates the situation where there are actually parallel experiences of the past. So what appears to be a legitimate past in one area would be a forbidden past in another one. So how it is that you as a researcher deal with this, uh, how it is that you are uh, also being fair to the people with whom you uh, speak, but at the same time try to reveal all these multiple layers of experiences. Another interesting concept which I had discovered, um, also going back to my uh, previous work in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, was that against this top-down structured multiculturalism, I would like to discuss something that came out very strongly when talking to many people I had worked with, and that is multiculturalism from within. And what I mean by this is a way in which, first of all, let's think wh uh, about what opposes it. When I speak about bounded conceptions of culture and ethnicity, we're speaking about a field where people, uh, individuals, actually serve as containers of ethnic identity. So they walk around as these containers, and there is container A who comes to talk to container B, and if they are now coming um, for some reason in some good uh, positive relationship, then we're still seeing A uh, plus B plus C creates a good inter-ethnic uh, set of relations. But what about if you find that an individual in fact contains more than one uh, ethnic identity? And this comes up very strongly when people talk about their past that was lived um, prior to inter-ethnic violence, where in fact people who um, regret the events of the past recollect with equal strength the disappearance of certain relations, the disappearance of objects, the disappearance of a uh, particular um, setup of neighborhoods. So in a way, this is very much going against 
the definition of ethnicity as being something very homogenous. So we're, we can speak about a multiculturalism that is contained within individual persons rather than on a map of completely divided field. This is uh, something which uh, comes out so very strongly and it is so much taken for granted when people start talking about their uh, recent past. What unnerves them very much is when they start talking about how when they speak to outsiders and when they're trying to combat the new hegemonic nationalist discourse, how this type of experience is being completely uh, forbidden from articulation as if it has become a language that no one no, no, is no longer understood. So this is a very serious proposal for further research. <clears throat> so in terms of um, what kind of projects we find in the area that are considered to be building inter-ethnic uh, relations, well, there are many uh, projects to build multiculturalism that bring about uh, people of different ethnic background to conferences and workshops. This is kind of a very popular thing. And in particular, it is popular among young people. Certainly, if you are 25 and uh, just sort of enrolling in a master's program and coming from Kosovo or from Serbia or from Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is, of course, you can have a swell of a time if you're meeting at some uh, nice places at sea coast or mountains and um, spend a good time talking about how bad this nationalist past was in your region. Um, however, when we speak about the success or the lack of success of such projects, we're speaking about some uh, very uh, temporary and very cosmetic uh, situations of this, again, top-down uh, structured multiculturalism. Uh, so, here I just propose to make one difference. These uh, structured multicultural encounters, they aim and they possibly even succeed in bridging gaps. It is, uh, of course, quite, uh, it can be considered a success if these events such as those that I spoke about, these student workshops, student conferences, they receive media attention and eventually they are going to become more and more popular to be shown in various parts of uh, the region uh, that was previously, in, in which the violence took place previously, but their limit is to bridge these gaps. What I propose uh, to consider when we speak about when, when we study unstructured and hidden multiculturalism from the experiences of work and the examples of um, work to uh, recording the memories of a civil society in the recent past is that unstructured multiculturalism can actually carve new niches and can enlarge civil society, local civil society, in a more long-term fashion. In the end, I just mentioned uh, someone which is uh, someone, um, uh, something that is very familiar to those of us who are sociologists, and there is the concept by Granovetter of the strength of weak ties. Uh, so this is very important for us to actually theorize what kind of ties emerge when we study uh, different forms of uh, inter-ethnic relations and multiculturalism, that we need to be very uh, critical uh, and do our analysis with a long-term uh, perspective, also taking in mind the uh, importance of social movements analysis social movements theory, which is not very often used when we study nationalist violence and uh, consequences and aftermath of such um, violence. All right. Um, so I just actually also wanted to mention, since I see many students in the audience, 
um, I just want to kind of invoke the most uh, popular uh, political philosopher of our times that deals with multiculturalism, and that is Will uh, Kimlicka. And obviously, when I was speaking about the problem of uh, static and homogenized concepts of ethnic identity, I had in mind those conceptions that he offers in his understanding of multiculturalism and in his theory of liberal multiculturalism, cultural homogeneity uh, in ethnic groups is taken uh, for granted. So um, what I think is the problem of accepting this given uh, structured multiculturalism and applying it to a certain area through these packages of uh, foreign aid is that it contributes to the freezing of ethnic distinctions, which is very, uh, a very negative process in the areas where already nationalist violence had taken place. Thereby, it even heightens the potential for further uh, nationalist, ethno-nationalist conflict. And also, there is a problem in these acceptance of top-down multiculturalism is that it sort of takes my members of minority groups outside of what is perceived to be a normal uh, societal, um, uh, normal societal shared institutions. I would argue that in this particular way of uh, taking minorities outside of the normal society, actually their situation is worsened rather than, uh, pro rather than making them protected. Also, by singling out minorities in this uh, newly rebuilt multicultural milieu, it actually provokes and can further strengthen internal power uh, disequilibrium and it can create serious power inequalities within the minorities. And finally, going back again to the examples that I brought from the sphere of labor and work, uh, this top-down multiculturalism takes away public attention from some lasting and deep contradictions in the society, primarily those that are taking place in the sphere of work and the economy. All right. Um, so further, to say what the consequences of freezing, the, freezing these ethnic uh, identities and politicized ethnic culture is, is that it contributes to even not only societal, but also moral and political disqualification of minorities. Since minorities are now not, accredit, not given the same rights and social obligations as members of the majority, uh, it provokes a question of why they should be treated as equals in other areas of life as well. So this is, uh, of course, the question how we can combat the, poli the further politicization of culture in the areas where we have this uh, situation of protracted violence and the rebuilding uh, of the society both on the political and social and economic levels. How it is possible to combat this politicized culture and go against the collectivization of rights? Is it only because it is incompatible with individual rights or we can actually propose some alternative to both current collect collectivization of rights based on ethnicity and an alternative to the still current uh, liberal concept of individual rights. Can we, as social and political scientists, actually contribute to uh, creating some uh, alternative to both of these um, concepts? All right, so I should just end by asking the question with Gellner, how can we proceed with having nationalism that is only cultural but having cosmopolitanism that is political. Thank you.
Um, you could, you could buy I think it you could, yourself. yeah, yeah, you, sure. You, you, I guess you yeah. pass it around to people, okay? So, yeah, comments, questions, conversations. Thank you very much. It was very impressive, really. Your discoveries, your new concepts. Uh, when we talk of multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious coexistence, we usually envisage uh, something at the highest political level. But you came down to the workplace, which is very impressive. When we talk of, uh, we discuss issues about the city of Kirkuk or the city of Jerusalem, Al Quds. We usually talk about the, uh, some <coughs> political contracts between Kurdish leaders, Arab lead, or Sunni Arab leaders, and Shia Arab leaders in Kirkuk, Kirkuk or uh, Jewish high-level leaders, Muslim high-level leaders, and Christian uh, inside or outside leaders for Jerusalem. But even those high-level contracts and agreements cannot uh, lead us to real coexistence, to real agreements. Uh, I wonder whether those experiences at the workplace, uh, multi-ethnic co-working, co-creating, are exceptions? Or do you have the feeling that this can be uh, universalized. This can be in the future, for instance, in, in the Balkans, it can become uh, a real hope for those societies. Whether it is exceptional or it can be a source of future hope. Thank you very much. All right. Should I immediately answer and then we go with further questions? Okay. Sure. All right. Um, of course, these examples that I spoke about, in comparison to what is going on in the whole region, they are exceptions. But the, the real question for us is why they are exceptional. If you are um, having a head of these uh, top-down multiculturalists, multiculturalists, the answer is, well, that is because inter-ethnic relations are so bad, so this is why such examples are exceptional. I was actually trying to um, show here a different social fundament where actually you understand why these situations are exceptional. The primary, situation, the primary reason for this is that there is very little investment in work <laughs> generally speaking, because work is something that is the last concern of those uh, top leaders in charge who are actually uh, delivering aid and, of course, the local political leaders who are having distributive functions, uh, which we are all aware of. But from the point of view of how people who are practicing it are perceiving themselves, as I was trying to demonstrate, it is not only not considered an exception, but it is considered to be uh, almost uh, preposterous to, imp to impute that they are in need of someone else to teach them inter-ethnic relations and multiculturalism. This is not to say that people are not aware of nationalist violence that had taken place. But there is, there, are di there is a different approach of what is the place of nationalist violence and what is the place of civil society in this situation. So in a way, these are the voices that are fundamentally not heard. And of course, what is definitely not exceptional in the areas of my field, or such as Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia, is that um, inter-ethnic relations work very best among people involved in organized crime. You know, these people are better than any United Nations. Uh, I only spoke now about these normal, legitimate stuff, but actually the, the, the realm of uh, illegitimate and, and criminal and some very horrible activities that is taking place there cannot be imagined with 
thousands of people involved, you know, in very, very strong, you know, inter-ethnic networks. So the question is really whether, the, your question is whether it is a future. It, is a, it could be a future to the extent that there is enough pressure that is being put on those people who are at the top of decision making in delivering uh, financial aid and strategies in the region and where these, um, uh, the areas of recons reconstructing uh, work and employment is given due uh, priority. And I really thank you for this very informative and careful analysis. Because uh, they say we live in a globalized world. <laughs> but actually, we, we know so little about each other. I mean, uh, we keep hearing things about uh, the Balkans, the horrible stuff, etc., etc. But really, the, the, you are given, I think, a good sense of the incredible complexity of the situation right now there in the Kosovo. Um, I have two, two questions, actually, I don't know if they are questions, but one of them is about the, this um, top-down, you know, transcendent good of reason and uh, what it is actually doing or not doing on the ground. Uh, I think y you, have, uh, you have made a very nice uh, criticism of that kind of uh, European involvement uh, in terms of certain kinds of notions of civil society, democracy, etc., and whether they work or not, actually, to what extent they work on the ground. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, given that the people, uh, I mean, this is, this is what post-colonial studies taught us, right? Uh, but uh, and given that post-colonial studies has now become an established discipline, <laughs> Um, and I'm supposed to be the post-colonial studies type around here, but uh, you know, given, uh, given all this, um, uh, aren't we also forgetting perhaps uh, a little bit the other aspect in terms, in the sense that, that um, people on the ground, and NGOs are many, you know, it's a very heterogeneous field, you know that much better than I do. Um, given that, um, isn't there a certain kind of way that people on the ground, uh, you know, the people themselves, not, not Europeans, but the natives, uh, approach to this European good that comes from above and from outside as a kind of really totally pragmatic, practical, instrumental kind of thing, and um, by means of which they could, um, you know, um, they could reform their own society and their own situation. What kind of instrumentalities do they develop in that sense? That's what I'm wondering. You know, that, that, that would be one question that I have. I mean, it's a little bit of an abstract question. I don't know, but uh, if it makes sense to you. The other thing is, of course, um, I mean, given this, the big, you know, multiculturalism, Western thing, the grand Western invention and all that. Well, of course, the Balkans, I mean, is a perfect example. Of a, of a society and a region that has a very long history of multiculturalism because first uh, Ottoman imperial multiculturalism and then uh, totalitarian socialist multiculturalism and these were all multiculturalisms of one kind or other. Uh, so Balkans have actually a long experience, uh, a long historical experience in multiculturalism, various different ethnic and religious communities living together and so on and so forth. And there's also, uh, I would say, uh, a kind of a practical, you know, uh, sort of spontaneous multiculturalism that, that people make possible in their everyday lives, and on which actually these, all these state multiculturalisms are built in the last instance, maybe. Uh, but when we look at this sort of natural, spontaneous multiculturalism, I mean, it's, it's, it's again a little bit of an abstract question, maybe, but. One of the things that make it possible is, uh, you know, I mean, you could tell a lot of jokes about that, is actually exchange of human. <laughs> I mean, exchange of human is one of the things that makes all these historical ethnographic multiculturalisms possible. What would you say, uh, what would you say in that respect uh, in terms of the role that human play, you know? Uh, Intermarriage, of course, exchange of human. I mean, exchange of human in the... In the and men. In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I presume that they are sometimes involved. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But... Um, uh, yes, of course. Uh, 
uh, exchange of human in the sense that Levi Strauss, you know, talks about exchange of human as, as one of the means by, by means of which the so-called primitive communities mm -hmm. enter into all kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm wondering, what's the role played by women? Because women have been given in a, a certain kind of role in the exchange of women. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that we can, I guess, push this concept a little f further. Do you see a role played by women uh, in, a, in a very, on a very uh, down-to-earth, ground level, um, in this sense, in terms of rebuilding uh, the relationships between communities and all that? All right. Uh, about the first question about this more pragmatic um, approach to foreigners and to the European Union, of course, there is a, um, that is kind of the only thing that people are really interested when you ask them about what it is that they expect from foreign aid. Um, it is only the politicians who like to, you know, use this kind of. Uh, Ver talk about virtues and this and that, but uh, ordinary people are interested in actually getting, primarily young people are the only ones who actually have immediate possibilities to use uh, foreign aid, primarily by getting fellowships and because such a large proportion of young people actually wants to leave uh, these areas and never come back, um, so actually taking some fellowships and going to study abroad is one of the primary imaginations among young people of what you get from, from foreign aid. Um, apart from that, uh, there is um, the, the, the initial enthusiasm that existed, for example, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and in Kosovo uh, in the late 90s or the beginning of 2000 in terms of what it is that you can expect from uh, the United States, from the European Union, that already started by and large um, dissipating, simply because um, in terms of uh, economic improvement of one's life, the results had not been uh, so impressive. So in terms of, uh, on the other hand, you know, these people who work already for many years in NGOs and new generations of people who get employed in uh, NGOs that are run by foreign uh, foundations, that's another opportunity structure that many people are interested in. So this is some, some kind of a career path that sets you very much apart from the rest of the society because everyone who works in such places must speak foreign languages and they receive higher salaries. Of course, they also have short-term contracts. Um, so there is kind of a, a, you build your career by hopping from one foundation to another, to another NGO, and so this is uh, also what is perceived as a very good utilitarian uh, path for many people, but when you speak about how it is perceived by people who are not part of this whole NGO market, uh, I cannot say that people look at it as something very positive, because they see it as some kind of temporary establishments uh, where people find jobs uh, based on some kind of short courses that they take, uh, you know, young people who take some masters and then come back. So in a way, it is not perceived as something that is going to be organically part of their society for a very long time. We're running out of time, right? No? Okay. So, so there, there is, uh, you know, the, there is no comprehensive research yet about what exactly is the mismatch or a match between the expectations of the local people from foreign intervention in terms of what it does to their everyday life. There are only surveys, there are tons of surveys that are constantly put in the media, but I would not consider them really reliable because they mostly uh, s look at uh, how public opinion reacts to some particular event, what it is that, for example, is done in a particular uh, time, and what is, who agrees, who disagrees. So it, it is nothing very comprehensive. I don't know to what extent this answers your question, but you know, I can give you only kind of partial observations. The second question about the role of women, why I, it's a very novel term, exchange of women. I have not heard it yet. Uh, but um, my work on women 
which answers your question, is primarily on those women's groups who were involved uh, in uh, various anti-war activities starting from the early 90s onwards. Because in the uh, nascent anti-war mobilization that took place in the countries of former Yugoslavia uh, prior, immediately prior to the outbreak of the wars, the vast majority of the people who were involved in these groups were women. And there are several reasons that take us primarily to the recent history. Unlike the rest of the communist countries, uh, Yugoslavia, of course, was not part of the Soviet bloc, so there was uh, a fledgling uh, feminist movement that primarily existed as series of forums that were taking place from the late 70s onwards. And these were, of course, very not of course, but they were elitist groups of women who were intellectuals and who were actually critical of the failed promise of gender equality that the Yugoslav socialist, socialism did not deliver. So these were like critical uh, feminists who have were worked in close touch with uh, various Western feminist counterparts. There was a very vivid international exchange because Yugoslavia was not a closed country. People could travel without visas. And so these, kind of, these forums were one of the uh, breeding grounds for this anti-war mobilization that took place in the early 90s. But of course there were many uh, other women who joined after the wars had become very violent, many of these groups, of course, started taking on very typical female domestic role of taking care of refugees, uh, assisting um, women in uh, finding shelters, trying to organize uh, some kind of uh, social networks for them in places uh, where they were receiving refugees. Uh, also building special uh, groups to assist women who were victims of the war rape. So yes, the role of women, perhaps it was not what you implied, but this was kind of the role of women that was very prominent starting from the early 90s onwards. So th I think this is a very different issue from what you implied. You spoke about interesting marriages, um, and I, I'm speaking about activism. So. I, I just, I'm not sure how I can address this from your point of view, because I, I don't deal with very, with, with, the, with the distant past. Yes, Yes, yes. I would be. Uh, uh, I would. Uh, I would speak in in the case of the research that I have done on this role of women in anti-war mobilization. I would see there that there is a fusion between these uh, inherited traditional roles of women that where they are providers, that they are nurturers, that uh, they are kind of. Uh, uh, having a role of a pacifier, but I think what is peculiar and what makes this situation very non-traditional, and that is that this particular habitus of women is taken out of their family setting. And so they're now uh, acting in a public sphere as anti-war, anti-nationalist activists, as reaching out to uh, people and to women of, from the other side, so to speak, when we are talking already about the nationalist war. So yes, you can say that these are uh, certain inherited aspects of this traditional habitus, but that is very interesting that they are now played out in the public sphere, which also explains why these um, anti-war uh, women's groups are so much hated in their countries, that in a way they expose certain uh, characteristics that are supposed to be kept and constrained uh, by male 
within certain sphere and they are actually becoming independent, independent. The most typical case is that of women in black, which exists in Israel as well, you know, they, that's where they started. Uh, because in the Mediterranean uh, region, black is supposed to be the color of mourning. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can we move on in case, you know, uh, we have other? If not, I'm going to probably ask you a couple of, you know, I'm not going to ask you perhaps anything. These are some points to ponder. I mean, multiculturalism is a solution to all the problems that Balkans have lived through. It could be very nice, could be, you know, although it's very elusive and all that, it could be a nice concept. It could be you know, you could dwell on it, you can think about it, you can theorize about it, you can do work on it through local NGOs and international aid. But I guess it doesn't take place in a vacuum, does it? You need politics, you need a political configuration, you, had, you, have, you need a state machinery to go with it, you need some kind of distribution of power, you need constitutions to go with it. And that, of course, is, is something where I, you know, like to say a few things about, it's not just this international donors or NATO or EU or, or UN, all these activities. I don't think they're just against failed states as such. It's not just an intense dislike of what has gone wrong in the past and therefore sweeping them aside. I, I sense, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, a very, very huge dislike of politics as such. I mean, I, I sense mm. anti-politicalness mm. in international or international activism in many countries in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. You know, politics should not be, the new order rather, should not be based on a kind of politics which is practical, which is not necessarily based on any ideologies, uh, the uh, pragmatism and practical, in other words, and messianic, that kind of, you know, understanding. The, the, this is uh, 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 not normal politics, as you kept referring to, you know, not normal. Mm -hmm. It's something out of the normal, and therefore it's not really real politics as such. It is, it's got nothing to do with ideas anymore. All you have to do is physical arrangements for this and that. But I don't know whether you agree with me, this anti-political sentiment in international uh, sort of relationship with the post-crisis societies. That's one thing. And secondly, what Mustafa Bey said about Iraq reminded me of something the foreign minister had said, and which ties up with what you've been talking about as freezing of ethnic definitions in constitutions. That was years ago, I, I read in the papers what Ahmed Davutoglu had said, that the recurrence of Sunni, Shiite, Kurdish, Turkmen identities in the Iraqi constitution reminds me, Mealen, reminds me of the Yugoslavian experiment in the Balkan. Are we going to repeat another Balkan experience in, 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 in the Middle East? You know, what he was referring to is the, is the danger that you're referring to, or you did refer to actually in your power project and in your explanation. That is, uh, by making constant references to uh, ethnic identities, the existence of ethnic identities, to the necessity of coexistence of this and that and that and that group together, you actually institutionalize, you highlight and you sort of uh, create a dilemma, in a sense. This is a dilemma, I guess, of constitution writing that Ahmed Davutol referred to, and you referred to, if I'm not mistaken, in your talk. So I, 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 what is your take on that either? So of being a political scientist, I try to bring in politics mm -hmm. to this analysis sure. to some extent. Thank you. Um, well, I agree with you that it is definitely not just uh, the situation of the dislike of states, but uh, certainly in the context where the states had disintegrated due to violence, that is, this is simply 
kind of the layout on which then this intervention is taking place. So part of the discourse and the rationale of doing any kind of Western intervention and then subsequently providing humanitarian and developmental and aid for civil society is that we are speaking about the failed state. So not necessarily that there is, you know, um, some kind of a hate towards the state. So this, this is kind of an official discourse. But I also agree with you that there is a stance that politics is just not important. And this is one of the reasons why I actually was trying to show that this kind of new civil societies are imagined as something very powerful. So this is part of this anti-politics stance. I, I probably should have stressed it more. So uh, while the, uh, the lack of appreciation of the state is kind of a good official explanation why these societies are inviable without uh, foreign intervention, without this kind of rebuilding institutions according to certain designs. Uh, but I think what is extremely important where um, I tie uh, to, to what you said is that um, civil societies are supposed to take up the less political role in rebuilding the healthy society without anything resembled old-fashioned politics. So I, I completely agree with you and I think this whole uh, construct of this omnipotent uh, civil society is also quite, is part of that and it is also quite dangerous when you actually study on the ground what it is that civil society can do. You know, because in fact, they can do very little without the backing of the foreign donors on the one hand or in the situation when foreign donors start to withdraw or when the funding is severely depleted, that they actually are pushed towards uh, collaborating with pol local political elites. So, of course, this whole idea about the non-political civil society proves to be completely inviable and we can only speak about the damage of imagining that such societies should be, you know, the model of, of good new societies. And then when you mentioned the situation in sort of the, the new Iraqi constitution, uh, it is um, something that um, is connected to the former, I don't know really what was the context in which uh, the foreign minister invoked the experience of former Yugoslavia. But in my previous work, um, which I still, uh, I think, very much kind of rely upon, and that is the study of the nationalities policies in the whole Eastern European and, and uh, Southeastern European region during the socialist era. Uh, what was relevant, in particular for the period of late socialism and the, the collapse of, of socialism, was that there were actually parallel realms. There was one official nationalism realm where you had this division of uh, the society into uh, ethno-nationalities. And you know, this was, you know, not to go too much in the past, but this was something that um, was first taken up um, after the First World War during the Bolshevik Revolution uh, through the work of Otto Bauer, transplanted to Lenin, transplanted to Stalin, and sort of it sort of was then uh, lived in, in all communist multi-ethnic states, this kind of the officialization of nationality. What was happening in places like Yugoslavia in the late socialist period was that you had a parallel realm of these official nationalities where political, top political and top economic managerial jobs were distributed according to the quota of the membership of the Communist Party plus the nationalities quota. But this was what you would call the realm of official politics. It was not a democratic country. So actually, the paradox of this official nationalist poli politics was that the vast majority of the population were left out from participating in this official late communist uh, nationalities policies. Uh, so, and for, for many people already, this was the experience of sort of uh, knowing that 
these nationalities, uh, co nationalist conflict that w started taking place prior to the disintegration of Yugoslavia was very much the making of the elite levels. So when in the aftermath of the wars, uh, and I think this is probably what your foreign minister was referring to, that the panacea for the, um, the nationalist violence then uh, when orchestrated uh, from the outside, in a way, then replicated this same model of the elite nationalism that, um, while I'm telling you now this whole story, because I really want always people to understand that there was a huge difference between how official nationalism operated on the elite levels and to what extent actually the majority of the population were left outside. So, because many people who actually adopt this nationalist thinking, they actually think that, you know, it is kind of, that nationalism is a mass uh, phenomena where it is very important to, to understand that it isn't. But definitely it is replicated yet again uh, because perhaps from the uh, point of view of conflict managers, it, it appears to be a much more convenient and less messy task. So I agree with you, but just what exactly is the cause of this continuous replication of the same model? The disadvantages of uh, sort of listing, mapping, numbering, you know. This, this, well, even this, if this you don't do it so strictly in the constitution, because in, in the region of former Yugoslavia, the new constitutions differ. And so in some of them, this kind of the, uh, the precise naming of ethnicities doesn't exist, which in, in practice, it doesn't mean that it is actually done uh, better than in other areas. But where I do see the problem that uh, reinstitutes these ethno-nationalist divisions is that uh, in the aftermath of uh, the war, for example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, there was uh, no uh, impetus, no willingness on the part of the foreign negotiators to actually uh, provide visibility and support to non-nationalist political parties. So that, for example, is for me one of the primary reasons why they continued to extol nationalist political parties and their factions with enormous access to both political and economic resources as the prime leaders of the population. So I think that is, continues to be the, the reason number one why this freezing of ethnicities is continuing. Well, I followed with very awareness this lecture, and it, it was very good. I'm from Kosovo. I'm a student here at Atsha University. And uh, it's true that situation, how you described how it is now, the position of ethnic groups in Kosovo, most of all, it's true. Most of them, it's true. But I think that in, in essence, there's no conflict between ethnics in Kosovo, but there's much more conflict between sub superpowers, like Russia, like USA. And this region always has been as arena of West and East powers from the ancient time to today. So we have a part that is pro-East and a part pro-West. For example, when we had a socialist Yugoslavia or a socialist Albania, there was no problem with ethnic groups. They were living together, even Yugoslavian inside. But when we have, after the Cold War, the direction of states, how, who, who is going to the to the NATO or to the Western world, and who is going to the West, to the East. So in this 
position, we have a, a birth of conflict. You have an Albania that wants to go to Western world and a Serbia that traditionally had relations with, with Russia. So here, the desire of Russia to be always a part of Adriatic Sea, to have there always a gate, to, to, to have a possibility to have gate in the Adriatic Sea. And we know that Albania in the socialist time had much more submarines than Italia. So it was in interest of Russia to have a, an influence in Balkans. So now we have a position where superpowers are clashing and we are suffering. Russia says, Serbia, you can't know Kosovo. If you recognize the Kosovo, you will have bad relations with me. And you have a relation, uh, leadership of Kosovo that is pro-Western pro world, that doesn't want to have a relation with Eastern world. In this context, it's, for example, when Serbian and Albanians, there's no problem. They can live together. But where Serbia says, hey, you can't live there. Why? It's a country that doesn't exist. You can't recognize this. You can't take the passport of that country. There's conflict. Or where are taking a double salaries from Kosovo and from Serbia, it's conflict of interest. So in generally, I think that this is the biggest, pro the biggest problem, being a historical arena of several powers. Well, if I understand you correctly, what you were saying is that currently you see as one of the biggest problems the situation that uh, Kosovo cannot have its immediate recognition of sovereignty on the part of Serbia due to the involvement of the international uh, powers. This is really not my area of, of research, but what I can say is that uh, time has shown now, since 10 years ago, that in fact what appeared to be impossible two years ago, that Serbia would change uh, its approach to Kosovo and start negotiations with the Pristina authorities now has happened within a very short period of time and that during this time Russia really had nothing to say which is not the first time that Russia didn't have anything to say uh, because clearly um, in terms of what uh, both the US or Russia are doing on the ground in Kosovo right now is not very much it is just not very much. So uh, the, what is happening in the last year or so is solely occurring uh, within the European Union vis-a-vis -vis Serbia and Kosovo. With the recent visit of Hillary Clinton to the Balkans, there was nothing except symbolic support for what the European is primarily perceived for good reasons as the power in charge. So I agree with you that you know there is, there is perhaps sometimes even a good feeling among many people when you can blame someone else. Um, and it, in a way, I think psychologically it alleviates you from the pressure of listening for many years what local nationalist leaders are telling you that you guys cannot live together. Uh, your neighbors are out there to kill you if you do not arm yourself. So from a psychological point of view, I think sometimes it is just good. And you know, there is always truth here and there. I mean, there is perhaps quite a possibility, there was a possibility in the late 80s that if former Yugoslavia was given an economic bail in the amount of let's say 50 million dollars that the technocratic government that was pan-Yugoslav at the time could have survived and could have prevented the war. And of course you can say, well, you know, these foreigners, of course they at the time were not interested in, you know, some peanut country like Yugoslavia. They were interested in dealing only with the Soviets at the time. And, you know, it is a plausible um, 
phases. However, in respect to what is happening right now, I think that the future uh, for Kosovo to have its sovereignty recognized by Serbia in some form is going to happen pretty soon and Russia is not going to be part of the pulling back. That is what I think. Uh, but thank you, this was kind of very precious also that, that you spoke as someone coming from Kosovo um, with these sentiments. <laughs> I can yell. And I was so grateful for the life of the thoughtful thing, very serious, and very creative. And she came all the way from Glasgow. And driving from Belgrade. Belgrade. With a car. <laughs> <laughs> Adventure. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. You're a wonderful audience. I wish you all the best. Just drink because my cough is killing me. Where are you from exactly? I'm originally from the city that is called Novi Sad. And that is in the Vojvodina province in the north of Serbia, close to Hungary.